Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Alyssa Stone, and I am the Senior Director of Programs and Community Engagement here at Mechanics Institute. Greetings. Welcome to Mechanics Institute, a historic gem nestled in the heart of San Francisco. Established in 1854, Mechanics Institute is a haven for intellectual exploration, offering a rich blend of library resources, literary events, and cultural experiences. Join us in celebrating knowledge, community, and the vibrant spirit of the city. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, today we delve into the fascinating confluence of AI, authorship, and ethics. As artificial intelligence shapes our creative landscape, questions of ownership, accountability, and ethical boundaries arise. Join us in exploring this intricate dance between technology, creativity, and the moral compass that guides our brave new world. Do you think that sounded like a human? <laughs> yes, ChatGPT wrote that intro for me, making um, my world a little easier but a little more awkward. So tonight we are very excited to welcome our two experts um, who are going to help us understand and explore this interesting intersection of AI, authorship, and ethics. Um, a little bit more of a surprise for you, I have ChatGPT rewrite their bios. <laughs> so I'm going to read that as well to help introduce um, our two guest speakers. Denise Kleinrieker, PhD, is a professor of management ethic and ethics at San Francisco State University. Formerly serving as the interim associate dean of the Lamb Family College of Business and director of the Center of Ethical and Sustainable Business, she focuses on integrating ethics and sustainable business education, community service, and research. Her academic career centers on business ethics, compliance, corporate social responsibility, sustainability, and women entrepreneurs. With extensive teaching experience, she offers courses in undergraduate and MBA programs. Her research contributions span peer-reviewed articles and book chapters in ethics, risk, CSR, Sustainability, and Women Entrepreneurs. Her academic journey encompasses a BA in economics from Indiana University, two master's degrees, and a PhD in philosophy ethics from the University of South Florida. Was that accurate enough? That was accurate. All right. <laughs> Check one so far. Professor Dragutin Petkovich earned his PhD in biomedical image processing at UC Irvine. With over 15 years at IBM Almaden Research Center, he contributed significantly to computer vision, multimedia, content management systems, and founded IBM's QBIC Query by Image Content Project. Recognized with numerous IBM awards, he became an IEEE Fellow in 1998 and an IEEE Life Fellow in 2018. Don't throw it back You'll tell us in a minute. Dr. Petkovich held technical management roles in Silicon Valley startups, including VMware, and later chaired SF State University's Computer Science Department from 2003 to 2016. He founded the SFSU uh, Center for Computing for Life Sciences in 2005. Currently, he serves as a professor at the SFSU Department of Computer Science, leading the establishment of SFSU's Certificate, graduate certificate in AI ethics in collaboration in, with the schools of business and philosophy. His research and teaching interests encompass machine learning with a focus on explainability and ethics, global software engineering teaching methods, engineering teamwork, and user-friendly system design and development. How about that? Was that pretty accurate? <laughs> 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 tonight's uh, uh, event is of interest to you. We hope that you'll check out some of our other events and programs here at Mechanics Institute. You can find out more at milibrary.org. Coming up next Thursday, uh, November 16th, we have an event with John King from San Francisco Chronicle on his new book portal. And we have our biannual members meeting coming up uh, in December. So we hope that you'll check us out uh, with some other events. And of course, towards the end of our event this evening, we will have Q&A with our audience. I will come around with this microphone. 
and you'll be able to ask questions for our two esteemed guests. And I had ChatGPT write me a fun thing for that as well. <laughs> we'll have time for Q&A. This is your opportunity to post questions to our speakers. Please keep them concise and focused on inquiries. Let's make this space a dynamic exchange of ideas through thoughtful questions. <laughs> With that, please join me in welcoming Denise and Dragnuton. to um, interchange between a number of different um, ideas, topics, and, and ways of thinking and understanding what's going on there. Ways of thinking, it's not used to <laughs> ways of thinking about different aspects of um, artificial intelligence. Um, keep in mind, Dragoon is the expert in computer science. I am more expert in philosophy and ethics. So if you ask me a technical question, I'm going to turn and look right at him. <laughs> okay. So I think we'll get started. Want to skip that one? Okay. All right. So you're up. So uh, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm a technical person, but uh, I'm human centered. <laughs> disability. Uh, interdisciplinary does immediately. And all the studies of do you care for consequence of technology you are developing, the computer science crowd is the least concern of any social implications of today development. And that comes on and on. So I am not on that side, but I am computer science. So first to clarify what it is, Gen AI, generative AI. So classical AI tells you patient is healthy or sick. Generative AI creates content it creates texts and poems and images. That's why it's called generative AI. ChatGPT stands for Chat Generative Pre-trained Transformer based on large language models. And I'll explain that for general audience. Interestingly, they, as I read, decided not to give it a human name to make sure people don't get attached to it and kill it. Which I think is also a smart decision very fast um, kind of uh, spread hugely and the most tragic the most uh, well-known technology developed by open ai and um, anybody knows how it works i'm going to explain it easy if you're deeper than that sorry but i'm going to really explain it very high level and then we talk about consequences one of the best blogs explaining it Stephen Wolfram who made mathematical software. And I'm going to read it because it's perfectly set. And I give the link. The first thing to explain is what ChatGPT is always is fundamentally trying to do is to produce a reasonable continuation of, of whatever test. So it's super smart how to complete, to be really proved. Basically, it will generate the next test based on previous text and the huge language model it is. So that's the trick. It, they actually index enormous amount of content, billions of pages, created a large language model, and basically, by most reasonable, we mean what one might expect someone to write after seeing what people have written in billions of their pages. That's what it does. No intelligence, no emotions, he doesn't care about anything. Some people call it stochastic therapy. It's basically type a prompt, it's going to analyze the prompt, find the meaning of it, and then look into language model, which is encoded in very complex system of neural networks and transformer technology, not to bother you with this, and build one word at a time and actually complete the text. That's kind of in very simple terms. So next slide is maybe. And this is what you know I created myself. <laughs> not through you know anything. Basically, why it sounds intelligent is because we encoded the rules of art and knowledge and information in the language and we wrote it down. So they took and they indexed a lot of stuff that's written down. 
they scan it, they use the web and stuff, and actually build the language model which contains the syntax and semantics of how the words are used in very complex way, very sophisticated way. So when you ask it a question, it simply answers whatever fits the syntax and language model for those questions. It doesn't have any intelligence. It actually looks at the data. It's very complex interrelationship between words and meaning and syntax and actually creates the output. Does that make sense? So it's not reasoning. It's not intelligence. It's actually giving you the most likely response based on what millions of people wrote about what you just wrote before, and then one word at a time. So just to make it clear what, you know, no intel we have intelligence, we encoded it in the language. Chat GPT reads the large language model and repeats whatever is there, but in a super sophisticated way. And it turned out by doing that, it, it sounds like intelligence, sounds like maybe emotional and sentient, but None of that is true. It's simply repeating the words that fit the model. It's very important to know. So that's the idea. Uh, uh, you can also use it to create artwork by actually they they indexed a lot of artwork and extracted the meaning of patches of images and put it in the language model. So you do the prompt, it finds the right words that match your prompt and maps those words to images and picks up the thing. So immediately you can say, well, is this the horse that I created? How come it appears here? Or maybe it looks very similar to the horse that I designed, and this thing indexed it and created another content that's on itself. That's in the heart of it. And we'll talk at the end of the legal issues. It's actually very tricky, but so you can create are. And you can imagine um, fake news. You know, elections are coming. It will be drama, I can tell you that. So, uh, a lot of unsettled issues. Next, please. Impact concerns, uh, and I'm, I'm totally concerned. Uh, jobs, education, we in schools have to completely revise. You cannot ask students to write a report at home. I have one student here in my class. We ask them to, to use ChatGPT to summarize, then they summarize, then they criticize ChatGPT. But you can't just ask them for essays, so they can do it in three seconds or three weeks. Uh, creative works, machinery, self driving cars, you don't want all the accidents. Who's guilty? Who do you sue? Military, social, fake news, safety issues with fully automated systems, to the point that famous people in the field, like Hinton, Father of deep learning says, I'm afraid it will be more capable than humans. Will it be us versus them? <coughs> this is the first time that technology, this is what concerns me, is encroaching on the cognitive knowledge based jobs that traditionally humans will do. It's not just mechanizing something, it's actually the dialogue. So, you know. Uh, impacts to job market will be significant. And I am yes. One thing that we will stick on and later come back to the legal issue that Denise and I were able to find a, uh, a chief counsel of US Congress doing the legal analysis of Gen AI and copyright issues for US Congress. Perfect. And, uh, and we found it two days ago. And it's like well, three weeks old. Perfect, so we'll go into details. But here is an issue. <clears throat> you make career out of writing. They indexed your writing. I say, uh, write me a story about XYZ. I can even say, write it in Shakespearean mode. Write it like XYZ. It's going to pick it up and create. So it's a new thing, but it learned from your text. And I can sell it and make money, but it learned from your stuff. The image contains motifs from your artwork. 
where is the cooperation stuff? We'll go into that, but it's fascinating. And by the way, uh, uh, Upshot is not settled yet. It's just going through your legal system. It just entered the pipe. And FTC is, by the way, investigating OpenAI for violation of this. And I, I work on explainable AI. Like, tell me, and I think John Grisham and, and the crowd is submitted the uh, class action lawsuit on copyright. And the problem is, let me tell you, I stop fighting for forever about this. It's not the code that you can open, and there's a line that says, read John Grisham book, uh, I'll modify a few words, and I'll do it. It's trained on the data, it has large language model, which is which is a bunch of numbers and coefficients. It's unreadable to human. And the code of open AI, which I didn't see, I don't work on it, is engine that says that use it to train. But you cannot open it and see the rules that you understand. So these systems are very hard to explain and they're not judicially transparent. You cannot point to a piece of data that says, ah, you stole my work. And that is a serious issue, technical and legal and ethical. So um, I think the news is time for you now, probably. Yes. All right. So uh, we'll do questions. <laughs> uh, should we do questions later? Or, we can do questions uh, whenever you like. OK, anything Yeah. on this part, if you have any questions, maybe we answer now. Yes. Well, I have more questions, but I'll, I'll ask you one so how to use chat GPT and Dolly and Midjourney and so on and ask them not to screen whatever you enter or not to train their system on whatever you enter. Is there a, a clause that you can check the box and say, Actually, train your own? <laughs> it has been already trained. But now oh, I right. read, okay, remember, it's so new that you know I'm reading from news. I I don't have access to their code, and the code is unreadable to human. But they said you could actually mark your pages not to be indexed in the future. But uh, that's exactly my slides. If, if you saw one of the things, can can uh, ChatGPT? Can you create this? But don't use any copyrighted work. They're just working on it. But for now, they put everything in large language model without information of what's copyrighted or not. I've already scraped up until 2021 every yes. single copyrighted piece yes. of information. Let me be. I'm academic. I have been here so I can tell you whatever I want. <laughs> That's why tenure is made. If you know, it's done in Middle Ages in Europe to protect faculty from being replaced by the church. It's not a union thing. So, uh, they told you it's done, whatever it's done by 2021. Prove it to me. Yeah, well, they've also, I cannot. Yeah, ChatGPT so, 4.0 has already so, updated so it to I don't know. Who knows? That's another thing. I don't know. And can you judicially uh, test it? FTC might push them. But at this point, the answer is technology is pretty opaque. I don't know. So uh, whatever is created using whatever is created using one of those AI tools supposedly cannot be copyrighted because it's not a We'll come to that. I'm not a lawyer. I like legal system. Original law, and I just learned that from six page memo, which is great. And um, Alice, you can send people the link to it. It's fantastic. Original copyright law apparently refers to words done by humans. Not even like monkey randomly draws something you don't copyright that. But now the discussion is created by AI trained on human content. Is it copyrightable or not? Originally, uh, uh, the, the copyright office refused to copyright being created by AI. But some people are putting <laughs> lawsuits saying, and I learned that. Would we maybe should have gone to work, would be paid much more. If significant human design and intellectual effort went into creating the content 
also using chat GPT, it may be copyrightable. And it's undecided yet, it's going to be the thing. And there is a good resource at the end that I suggest you all read. It's very good, yes. Amazon, when you uh, put something up on the print on demand uh, platform, which is called ABT, yeah. uh, now you have to say whether what you're, uh, what you're turning into a book is either um, AI generated or AI assisted. If it's generated, it, it starts with the AI and you just twiddle it a little bit. And if it's just assisted, you've already written the book, but you're getting some editing and perking it up a little bit with ChatGPT. Yeah, so but it's still a total gray zone, and there's eight, and and I, today I, there's I, over eight thousand lawsuits. Yes, and I would say read carefully terms and conditions. Like with actors today, I read in Hollywood, they said um, uh, they control whether they can be replicated by AI or not. So it's all very important as we speak. Uh, let's see. The first statement is you didn't mention temperature which is, so then you don't get the same uh, exact, if you put in the same prompt and you get a different set of data, right? That's one, so if you could say that it is creating something different every time. And but B is, every time that I draw a picture, I'm drawing it, or I take a photograph, I'm drawing it from all other pictures that I've seen. Seen, which means kind of like this, shouldn't I be investigated for copyright infringement as well? And this what? is going to be the fight. Yes, it's precisely if I may answer. I was thinking, okay, it trained on works of famous people, but then it produced something. So I would read John Grisham's book and try to write the John Grisham book. For, for and and people have. Yes, but there is a trick I just learned yesterday. In training process, it had to copy your stuff into the database of OpenAI. You may not authorize it to copy, so you cannot train. And they are now drilling into that. But, but, but you read something. Yes. And then you, I, 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 this, is, this is going to be the fight. Because what says, it, you know, you, you have taken in that piece of information and you have, you have modified it ever so slightly in your brain, like you are a living piece of tissue, and so it's going to be all right. And I'm, this is where the fight is going to yes. be. And, and the other thing is that you, I mean, machines have created original content. Uh, and an example of it is a machine that has, that did create an original piece of information is uh, Google's Go, and they made a move that nobody in the yes. world had ever seen. I have a, yes, okay. I have a so I mean, it's a goal. Okay. Uh, no, so what you're yeah. saying is, like, yeah. it's not in this little box. It's a very big box, and it's got lots of water. Yes, and a lot of lawsuits scattered for lawyers, and, you know, it's actually going through the pipe. So even advice to Congress, I mean, the legal counsel advised the Congress don't Maybe don't change the legislation yet about copyright and AI. Wait a little bit for the lawsuits to go through the system and then do it because actually nobody is sure what to come up. I think that's a. Am I on? Okay. So, thank you for the thumbs up. Back. Um, I have a question. So, I'm going to segue into the ethics. We're talking about the technical, we're talking about the legal issues, but the ethical issues are also a concern. And as human beings, we tend to have some level of ethics, either personally or within our communities, our families, et cetera, our workplaces, and those kinds of things. And that is going to be inclusive of AI. What are the ethical implications in terms of artificial intelligence and its uses um, in, in today's society? So what we have, here we go, thank you. I'm, I'm hearing a parrot, so I can't hear myself. So, um, so who's impacted? We, we have something that we call a stakeholder model. Those individuals who have some um, level of impact by some external source or can impact in the reverse order. So a stakeholder model, and some of you might be somewhat familiar with this, when we talk from a business standpoint and look at what the ethical implications are, and that would include 
chat GPT, usage in business, or even in personal situations, where we have a company that has impacts by utilizing or creating or generating the use of AI, these are going to have impacts on a whole host of individuals. So you can see there, employees are impacted by the use of AI within a workplace or within their um, communication with other employees at other organizations. You have distributors, wholesalers, retailers that are impacted. You have consumers that are impacted from an ethical standpoint. Does that make sense? So some of you are shaking your heads, I can see that. Suppliers, creditors, stockholders are impacted by the ethical issues that we're dealing with. The natural environment, we haven't even touched that yet. What's going to happen in terms of our natural environment when we are looking at the usages of energy that are different than what they have been maybe in the past through the use of <coughs> chat GPT or other forms of AI? The public in general, business support groups, the media, non-governmental organizations, and so on. So we have a whole host of individuals that are impacted by any sort of change such as what we're seeing with the use of AI. These stakeholders have rights. Rights to basically have protection from unethical business actions or decisions. Can anyone think of um, an example? Let me think of an example. You can even look at what I've got up there in terms of these particular rights uh, and like, potential concerns from an ethics standpoint. Yes. Yeah, think about people that are going to lose their jobs. There you go. You know, and the not worry, just like, right. as pointed out earlier, not, not like the labor intensive type of work that robots have been doing for years now. Right. The white collar type of yeah, the change of what that employment might look like if it even changes or may may uh, be changed in a, in a way that dissipates what that, that function had been. Exactly. Um, there's issues in terms of consumer protection that are both ethical and legal issues. We're looking at wages that may be affected as well, for example. Um, workplace equality, discrimination. We, we have a lot of focus in making sure that we have diverse, equitable workforces, but we're also increasingly concerned about what might happen in terms of that, that focus. That is, can I just add a oh, big yeah. thing on bias and fairness, which is one of the big things of trustworthy AI. This thing uh, repeats what it learned. You have biased data, you're going to get biased decisions. So they put some guardrails and stuff, but basically, it can propagate whatever so that has to be taken care of. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And even if we get into the area of the natural environment, what are we looking at in terms of changes in energy usage? I heard another speaker talk about the environmental impact of um, chat GPT, and she said every time somebody makes a query using chat GPT, it's the equivalent of dumping two liters of fresh water on the ground. Is that true? I haven't heard that, but uh, I'll have to look into that. Oh, you yeah, may yeah, have a you may have yeah, some yeah, quickly, insight. Quickly. I mean, the strength of chat GPT would have taken 360 years on on regular machine. They use a thousand and EDI. Processors with this edit in a few weeks, their energy sinks. I even hear that they're thinking of putting them in North Pole to actually cool it, which they may, you know, uh, uh, kind of melt the, the stuff. So I don't know exactly, but it's not trivial because it has to go through the big language model and stuff like that. So possibly, I don't know, but. Energy usage is not the for sure. I forget the speaker's name, I'm sorry. On the radio. <coughs> Thank oh, you. That's, uh, that's the, yeah. yeah, but it's plausible that it's not the Another question here. Go ahead. When I think of uh, stakeholders and impacts, I think of children and kids. And, you know, if, if they don't learn how to write, or they, if they or think, how do they? Or think. Who are they? Who are they? Well, who are they? we had a, kind of a partial conversation just in the, in the car ride over. 
you know, in terms of our concerns. We're teachers. I mean, we're professors, but I mean, we teach. And, and even though our, our students are mostly adults, if you will, sometimes we get some, you know, super super high schoolers, but, but we're concerned about their ability to become independent thinkers, one, you know, and are they going to have the knowledge they need to really just navigate the world? In the same sense, if they're taking their term papers straight from chat GPT, or they don't have the knowledge base. Or advice. I, I also have a paper that it gives dubious moral advices and it changes. And let me tell you, I'm always suspicious of mother of science. Who trained it? So my kids go and ask for social advice from chat GPT. What is going to tell them, make it something not that I would advise them. And I always, I found that that uh, president of China said, and I respect China a lot, but he said, any Gen AI has to reflect the values of Chinese communist party. Therefore, <laughs> can you tell me on what material did you train ChatGPT? They don't tell me, they just say they scrape uh, one uh, terabyte of data. It could be data that maybe I don't read it. You see? Uh, issues. Okay. Um, so when we talk about the ethics of AI, there's a whole host of things we can start unpacking in terms of understanding where we need to start um, doing some remediation if we can. And those are areas of who takes responsibility. What about the idea of transparency and the awareness of where chat GPT or any type of um, AI um, usage might have some impact? How do we audit and assess the impacts? What about the ideas of incorruptibility? Can we predict what the next steps are going to be? Those kinds of things. So, you know, we both shrug when <laughs> we talk about that. Then we need to know who's going to be responsible for the action. Or the decision or as teachers are we responsible for our students knowledge acquisition or are we not anymore we start to wonder what our roles are going to be those kinds of things so again trustworthiness is another aspect oh, this is my, yeah so yeah thank you uh, so obviously we have more questions than answers but one of our roles because both of us started this certificate, at least to educate the public and alert them to issues, you know, not to blindly trust them. But if you think we are overly concerned, look at the initiatives going on today as we speak and, and last year. EU, always they always try to regulate that. The thing that's going on in the final stages of the legislation is AI Act, which speaks about trustworthiness and especially zeros on high risks, high impact applications such as autonomous systems and biometrics. That they have to be certified, regulated, auditable, and transparent. Okay? OECD has a principle. All the same, trust no bias, fairness, human control. When I gave some interview, they asked me, what are you most afraid of? I said, Skynet, Terminator 2, and very much. It's totally visionary, absolutely. Autonomous AI, that is the biggest danger. No human in the loop. Very difficult. Uh, uh, why I'll just issue AI directly, which is actually pretty well written. Kind of wish list, it's hard to accomplish. At least they wrote down all these good things we should watch. And it's actually pretty good. And just last week there was AI summit in UK with Top, our vice president was there, and top players, and uh, 27 countries signed the declaration. But here is a thing for you to think. How does chat GPT sound to you? Authoritative? Does it ever show any doubt in its response? The answer is no. No, show me what the prompt is. I'm, I'm talking the technical detail. But I mean, to understand the statement is, I can make it so that it, it talks to me as a four-year-old, right? 
Yes. Okay, so I mean, is it, I mean, if we have the variabilities in there, this black and white issue, do we have a problem? Yeah. Yes, but it will always say, certainly I can help you. Here is the answer. Does not give you the confidence level, does not say, I'm not exactly sure, to the best of my knowledge. So let's say you are managing a nuclear power plant and you say, Chat GPT, watch that domain, certainly increase the power, and it could be wrong. It doesn't say increase the power, but I'm not that confident. Please consult somebody. So make it autonomous. Good luck. Watch a minute or two. That's my fear. <laughs> so uh, let me just say sorry. The EU app has an explicit requirement called pull the plug ability of the human to pull the plug, which for me is actually extremely important. The thing that really creeps me out is that you can train ChatGPT to write code, and hackers, if hacker, hackers any rule whatsoever, and they'll try to break it. And they can, if you do that with ChatGPT, it's just, it's, it's infinite. You know? There's the fear, <laughs> yes. Having used ChatGPT to write code, it is not always correct. Exactly. So far, it's not always correct, yeah. but it comes, let's say, 80%, you fix it, but it's going to take that code, put back in the database, and learn, and learn, as Hinton said, much faster learning than human biology and brain can do. So what will be in five years? If you make some rules, okay, and um, that's what we're talking about here, is the problem is, I have a billion dollars, and I'm going to make my own chat GPT that is, will take on your chat GPT and fly and do everything else. I mean, the problem is, is like, we're in this nice little world, and everybody is, you know, how many people agree to the, uh, to the initiative? 28. I mean, it is, it, there's a lot of other people out there who have a lot of money and have a lot of energy and then they will do the same exact thing. So the problem is, is we're, we're essentially in a, uh, uh, a, a weaponization problem. And, and the problem is, I got a weapon, I make, if you make a weapon, you go, you're gonna go back and forth. That's what's gonna happen. And that has to happen. Uh, and, 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 it would not surprise me, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, and, and, but the problem is, is you have to figure out, you know, G7, they made an agreement. Who the hell care? I'm, I'm, I'm China, I, you know, or I'm Indonesia, or I'm somebody else. You know, I don't care. Correct. I think I, I I think this sounds you know dark, but I cannot disagree with what you say. And one of the things that forced them to do this summit and the White House is the fear, and also fear in upcoming elections and disinformation, which can be done perfectly. And uh, uh, they are trying to regulate, but Bill Gates had a good, um, you know, he's a techie, he's probably funded this. He had good thing. He said we invented fire, explosives, nuclear energy, but we regulated so far. So he said we need speed limits and seat belts, meaning the regulations. So um, uh, it will be challenging. Yes, this is very disruptive. And in software, it's easy to spread the problem. Sorry, it's as Hinton said, um, you have to train, let's say, soldiers to do something for four years. You can download the whole chat GPD in five seconds. The whole knowledge, bingo. In five seconds, they learn everything that you learn. And it's really scary. The speed of learning and improvement is faster than humans can do. And I think that's why I'm proponent of some regulation, like in any other dangerous thing we develop, there is regulation and monitoring, and that's our chance. But there will be actors who will exploit it, for well, sure. And, and I mean, Meta let out their model. Everybody is modifying the Meta model. It is the Meta model is turning out to be it is the new standard. That everybody is adhering to, which is like just freaking out everybody else.
but 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 that means that I can take the meta model and make and do my modifications. On it. And I will develop my meta model oh, no. to protect me from your meta but, right. model. So, so here we go again. The wild west. I have a gun and I have a fence and I interview. If I don't like you, I shoot. That's maybe in virtual space, but. Well, the Japanese I think power plant that was uh, melted down because of the tsunami, that wasn't factored into <laughs> when they built it, but there might be a tsunami that would cause it to melt down. I, I actually know there was an old engineer who told them, don't put the power generators in the basement, they might flood, and they overruled it in hierarchical. So some people knew what bureaucracy messed up. So the regulations can be also defeated and messed up. Yes. We have a couple other questions in here, and then there. So my <clears throat> question is, how do we balance ethics and progress, right? Because when progress comes in, and somebody loses their job, because the machine or the AI does a better job, cheaper, and the person potentially needs to find a new position, it's partially a progress, not necessarily a job. So how do we balance that? That's, that's a question that's age old. How do we balance in any kind of endeavor, whether it's, it's, it's some type of business that we, we're looking at and looking at, you know, um, AI, et cetera, or just getting on with neighbors, those kinds of things. How do we balance? I mean, there's a number of ethical theories. I don't want to go professor on you. <laughs> you know, we've got a number of theories that help us kind of solve some of those predicaments. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in terms of, you know, you could do a utilitarian, greatest good or greatest number of people. That's how you make a decision, okay? Um, you can go a duty-based kind of theory. You know, you can, you can look at virtues and how do we exhibit those virtues in these decisions. And sometimes people go down rabbit holes trying to chase after which which is the ethical way to, to make a decision here. My simplistic is do no harm. But then you have to start defining what is harm. It's not necessarily harm for everybody, it's, and that it's, sort of thing. Yes. It's, it's, tricky. it's very tricky. Um, uh, in White House Directive, there is a whole section on protecting U.S. workers and stuff. The problem, if you remember Ned Blood or Lund, you know the textile workers in England that broke the machines? And, and my techies tell me during dinner, oh, you know, they broke the machines, but at the end, they retrained, everybody got more jobs in the whole revolution. I say, yes, it took 30 years. This is going to take a few more months. That is the problem. Are you going to retrain somebody in Virginia to do ro robotic programming when in three months they're out of jobs? My students in computer science, there is zero opening for young graduates in computer science today. I don't know why. Maybe partially because of this, so tricky. But I also want to make sure we have time to cover the legal copyright yeah. issues. I know how much time, but let's go and then I'm in five minutes to go to all this stuff from. Sounds yeah. good. I think you had your yeah, I, just want to, I just want to bring up this question of this information is one thing, but the evolution of information is another. Since the printing press in the 1600s or whatever, the majority solution for energy has been oil and gas. Uh, alternative energy has been a recent development. And so 90% of the info coming in is the energy solutions coming to add to the GTV, excuse me, into the AI, is old history, uh, older information. Uh, and that's the, and I think what I'm hearing from you guys is they just take all the information and average it out, and that answer, the next word, is the average of all the words oh. that would normally fit there. But the average is based on crap history, or disinformation, or lack of new, proper, scientifically generated, real good info that we know now. Um, is that terrible? Um, yeah. Uh, yes, biases are simply translated, communicated as they were recorded. Um, I think new chat GPT will improve, but you, you touched on one big question which we told to our students. Use it to polish your writing, to look at your code, but don't use it for factual search because it cannot point to source like Google search. I think they're fixing it now, but that was the major objective. And remember, there was a whole lawsuit against United Airlines written by ChatGPT with fake, it's written like case studies, case legal studies, 
when in the proper format they didn't exist because it learned the form of writing it to just plant some words, you know? So, um, um, uh, there's the trick, right? So, it's good to polish some text. It's still not good to perfection research because Google will index it within two seconds. This thing takes, you know, three months of supercomputers to train. So, there is still some room for it, but it's getting better and better. And it sounds again authoritative. It wrote the wrong things to my friends who they asked them to summarize the wrong companies they started. It completely said different things in a very authoritative way. So, you know, but they're improving. That's, they know that and they're improving. So, I want to hear about copyright. Yeah, okay. We, Denise, you want to wrap up your reply? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Well, oh, this is like we can make this key. You want to skip that? Okay. Yeah. Let's, so, this is the document that is from, I think, September 20 or 30 or something, very flash. And I found it by chance. Look at the four questions and then this for conference. Do AI outputs enjoy copyright protection? Model? So, I get one slide for each. So, this next one. So I try to extract words from the documents. It's in the code. So do AI outputs enjoy copyright protection? US Copyright Office recognizes copyright only words created by human beings. But now, of course, people are challenging that by putting lawsuit because this was written before machines were able to go on. So its guidance is to accept that words containing AI generated material may be copyrighted under some circumstances, circumstances such as sufficiently creative human arrangements. The author may only claim copyright protection for their own contributions. So, interesting analysis, but at the end it says it has not been settled. But it's very good for, I think, whoever is interested in six pages, very well written in terms of pros and cons. Who owns the copyright? That's another one. I can. Denise and I were. This is the same questions he had. This person answered them, or at least laid out the issues. No clear rule has emerged identifying who the author or authors for these works could be. Companies that provide AI software may attempt to allocate the respective ownership through poker. You like, you know. I agree to terms and conditions. You don't read it. I say, from now on better read because they're trying to do it. Maybe you can sue them, but they are already modifying their terms and conditions to that, like terms of service. It's fascinating. Very well written stuff. Next one, please. Does AI, ah, this one was new for me. Does AI training process infringe to copyright? That was unknown to me. I created something that writes or draws like Picasso. But I didn't copy it pixel to pixel. But now they say um, the district court ruled that the jury trial would be needed because creating copies of data, even for training, may infringe on copyright law. You are copyright owner. You can put in terms and condition may not be copied for the purpose of AI training. But people didn't know that, and they already scraped it. You know so. Uh, to be decided. And then the last one is uh, uh, do AI outputs infringe copyright in other works could potentially be liable, both the company and the author. So none of it seems to be settled. But then the last one says a recommendation to Congress. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Congress may consider whether uh, 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 any, all of these require new amendments, but they say better way to see what the jurists decide and maybe then amend the laws of copyright. So, there you go. But it was the best thing I found to answer kind of what's in this audience. Well, an intellectual property um, lawyer that I talked to, and only something like 1% of all lawyers are actually intellectual property lawyers. So it's job security for anyone who wants to go to law school now. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he said basically every single thing that they scraped up until 2021 was already copyrighted. Because according to the US 
uh, PTO patent and, and trademark office. Uh, just simply by publishing something or writing it, it's all automatically copyrighted. If, if, if you want to take it to federal court and take someone to court and sue them for stealing what you did, then you know then you get a, a C copyright or an R registered or you know. But, um, everything is automatically copyrighted. Yes, since but, it's written. Yes, then uh, the the people who use let's say ChatGPT to write something based on your writing will say I did not copy word word, right, which copyright is, it protects the particular embodiment implementation, exactly, not the English as a language. That's why but, they want a jury trial, so they can sway people's emotions. It's that's so why, but it's that's what they said. It, it would have been illegal even to copyright into the engine for the purpose of training. That was for me kind of an interesting twist, so to be decided. Many lawsuits coming down the Many, yes. Alright. How, how are we doing on time? We're good? Okay. Yeah. First <laughs> question. <laughs> exactly. I can interject again. Then Other you questions? You try, um, if you want to see ChatGPT become accurate, go use the ChatGPT open button. You will start to see the real package. The ChatGPT yes. what? Plug in. So ChatGPT is they have that if you go to the twenty dollar mode right. is that you can add in plugins and the plugins is one of the plugins is Wolfram so it does all the mathematics and it has maps and so like that and another plugin is Travelocity so that if you start asking it questions about travel then it go ChatGPT that getting live data is is going out and talking to Travelocity, and Travelocity is telling them real facts. Yes. In real time. So I am, and you can also ask, there's a plug in to, this is, you know, it's ChatGPT, and what they're doing is they're adding modules onto the side that are live, and you can go and say, go and look at this web page. Yes. Uh, New York Times. Totally. Remember, this Monday was uh, the developer, OpenAI developer. Thing. They announced a ton of things, APIs for you to write application. What I'm saying is, it was not accurate last month. They all know it's an issue. People will write plugins, it will be solved. And then it will be more. And then it will be more. And then it will be more. No, so the kids will only learn to type into ChatGPT. Prompt engineering will be the main skill. How you talk to it, and it tells you something and you do it. And maybe it's wrong, maybe it parents don't like it, maybe it's controlled by Schmack or whoever that is, the billionaire or the government or what. Uh, I come from the old Yugoslavia, beautiful country, not behind person, but you know, it's got a feel for it. And I don't like a bit of all this. I don't like central source to manage. Anything that's centralized historically failed. The nature makes the forest of multiple genes and multiple individual agents. And you know, our applicants tell me, oh, ChatGPT AI, smart city. Everything is connected to my computer, to one computer and say, good work. Good luck to you when that gets hacked or controlled. You'll see what you get. So, um, I don't know. I'm for little people kind of maybe fighting back being independent because this looks like Skynet. That you should play that little play. <laughs> there is a click. Um, well, um, Alice, tell us when we have two minutes left and then I play a clip. Go for another five minutes and then okay. we'll do an official wrap and then we can play some Terminator. <laughs> I have Noah, Noah, because today, I mean, Elon Musk and many smart people said, I fear Skynet. You know, you will see it. it's perfect. I mean, unfortunately. Yeah. So, what's that? Well, kind of on that point, the AI is learning from sort of everything that came before, and everything that came before talking about AI was saying that it's going to become self-aware and kill everyone. Isn't the AI going to be Uh Apparently, 
US apparently the news, they did the gaming, put the rules, and AI was one of the players in, in military games. And it played one move and won, and simply by killing everybody instantly, it won. Because the optimization function was winning the game. No emotion, no this, I just kill everybody in the game. That's it, you know. That was the objective of the game. Yeah, and, but nobody thought, everybody thought it would. Objective of the game is to win, and you go by the, the rules. Well, it found that actually the simplest one is to kill everybody and just walk through the game. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, well, that was the rule. That could, I don't know what was the rule, but yeah. you figured out this is the simplest way to win, right? You'll see the yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So based, based on your technical knowledge, and, you know, you've been in the field for quite some time, do you think it's possible with current uh, AI frameworks that uh, the original authors can get micropayments whenever they want to you, I will answer you the following way, then the mistake. Would business do it on their own? My thinking probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, being now oh, yeah, okay. here, but, but the, I hope the US Supreme Court, you know, and somebody can say you either cease and desist or you encode, you know, what you trained and stuff. Algorithmically, I think it could be done. It, I, I, it's hard to say, it's so fuzzy, but um, it's a good research project, and I think that was one of my questions. People should actually get paid for the fruits of their work proportional to how much you produce in that. the fight that they had with Google. I mean, it's, I mean, we've gone through this in the last you know, 10 years ago, we went through this. Google's breaks the shit out of everything. Is they gave it away for free, and then there's lots of lawsuits that go on. It's like, it sounds like there's an echo in the room. You know, it's like they, that, and Google took all of our voices and put them, and you know, everything that you have put into Google uh, Mail, they got it. And I don't care. I don't care about that. I don't care about Google Mail. Uh, 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 and, and everything else is passive. And, and Google didn't pay. I mean, they won. There's a lawsuit in, uh, I think, Australia that they finally won that the newspapers are getting paid. And but but that took 20 years. Yes. So, I, mean, I think we have a question yes. center right yeah. center there. So we talked about uh, the, on the flow chart and other times about the narrowing down, uh, uh, oh, sorry, chat GTV feeding on itself. It's a feedback loop. It puts out information, and that's part of the information group. Over time, won't that in significantly make the language flatter? And mediocre, absolutely. And narrower, yes. and thought narrower, and at the very fast speed. You, you guys are wonderful audience. So even I have it in my class. I have a student there. We, so everybody will speak the same. I told them. You chat GPT will talk to my chat GPT and get stupid email from you. It's full of fluff, no, no personality. And, and it sounds yeah. like business. Uh, business. You know what I will say? It sounds like business until they destroy humanity. So who is going to pay their bill? No, but business uh, says loops of those, those stupid messages back and forth. And the thing that you're not, I mean, that. that, that you give given the impression that it's going to get the same answer every single time. Exactly. And that's what temperature is all about. And but that's why it's... Anything. All it can do is like freeze. No, no like that's that's what temp there's this thing called temperature that, you, that is very hard to explain. But the problem is, essentially, it, it doesn't pick the same... If you ask it the same question, it doesn't get the same answer. Correct. That's the trick. That the temperature was the thing that has blown all the AI scientists away. Thank you. Can we have another question over here? Let's get this question in too. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, it, it strikes me that technology is one thing. When it enters our economic system, technologies really raise issues of power and profit. Yeah. And who has the power? How is it used? Who makes the money? How is it used or gained? 
And I wonder if ethics is even in the same ballpark, because it's usually what in groups do to protect themselves from outside influence, like doctors, lawyers, journalists, and whether we need something that is closer to the slide about the different governments, where we need to meet power with power and regulate profit. Yeah, I mean, excellent points. A number of organizations of some size, and I, I, I can't do a pinpoint size of them, how many employees they have and, and, and their, their reach within the, the communities and whatnot, but a number of organizations over the last, I'd say, at least decade, have seen a strong leaning towards having an ethics and compliance office, not just the legal team, but an ethics and compliance office, and they are ethics and compliance officers. Okay. You know, we, we had an ethics compliance officer talk, you know, I've got a student over here, former student, um, come and talk to my graduate class. And these individuals are looking at beyond what the law might say in terms of what is appropriate. Increasingly, they're seeing that they're having to be pulled into the AI questions that we're struggling with yeah. in terms of what does that mean for the organization? You know, here I am, the ethics compliance officer, I might even have a department of a couple of folks. We might pull in a risk management department as well. You know, we're going to talk to the human resource people in the organization. We need to have a meeting of the minds to turn, turn some of these things into something that's going to be positive and meaningful in terms of our concerns, in terms of our... I, I, yes, and on top of that, I think there is one, always the same market to regulate itself. Interestingly enough, when top AI executives spoke to Congress, they all, they asked the Congress to regulate them. Because otherwise it's catastrophe. I'm telling you that. I mean, that's my opinion. So, um, industry in general never was doing it. The government would put controls and monopoly blah, blah, blah. This was surprisingly, you know, outcome from open AI. They all said, we need some kind of regulation because it's going to be Wild West. So um, I think some regulation is coming. That's money. And it's necessary. Well, one, one last yeah. question. Okay, one last question. I hope you are not online. But um, I'm having trouble with the whole big picture as everyone's describing it, including the questioners. Given that we're in the midst of this trans apocalypse with all these competing disasters, like the the evolution of democracy in the United States, about income inequality, about world conflict in Ukraine and Gaza, the climactic breakdown. And, and now we have to worry about generative AI. So like, which of these disasters, like doesn't the generative AI thing kind of trump them all? Because people will all lose their jobs on a mass scale by 2035. There'll be riots in the street. There won't be a functioning democracy to deal with it. We're talking about compliance officers when we can't even like we can't even run a Congress or Supreme Court in this country, never mind all the hackers who are gonna come in who don't care about government. Like like how are we supposed to the question is how are we supposed to position this particular disaster? In a large landscape of disasters, and what do we do first? Yes. I say let's offer a bottle of wine. Before <laughs> you know. But uh, you know, I don't want to sound negative. People always say at the end, the humanity found the uh, all you know fire and nuclear energy to benefit. This just worries me. It's coming so fast, and I do it, and I know. So control and maybe intervention, optimization. But you know, to be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, I don't know, and I'm concerned too, and hopefully what's positive is at least the top players, including governments, they do have a power. They got together and start talking about it. So uh, that's positive. I think at the end it will have to come top, maybe brutally from government, because otherwise well, we'll be, uh, over Ukraine and, and Gaza. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Obviously, this is a hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> we could go all night. Lukewarm topic. 
Um, I hope this is the first of many conversations that we have here at Mechanics Institute about generative AI and ethics, authorship, and ownership. Um, and we will maybe take a, an official end, but we'll play a little video of the Terminator. It's one minute. Yeah, it'll take me a second to pull it up. But before we get to that, I want to give the biggest thanks to our two esteemed guests, Denise and Jessica. I hope that you will stay for a little bit to continue chatting and connecting with one another. Um, yes. And a big thank you. I hope that you will come back and visit us for other events here at the Kent Institute. Uh, please visit milibrary.org to learn more about everything that we have to offer here. Um, very little AI in our programming. It all comes from the heart and soul. For now. Uh, <laughs> well, oh, no. And our library, of course, is still here with real books. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us. Let me pull up that video.